Today on the John Ankerberg Show, we are examining the evidence from astronomy that points to an all-powerful creator. We're also answering the question, why have so many of the world's leading physicists, astronomers, and cosmologists that used to be atheists changed their view after studying the intricate design of the universe? How many of them now say that they believe in God or an all-powerful designer? My guest today who will answer these questions is astronomer and astrophysicist, Dr. Hugh Ross, who obtained his Bachelor of Science degree in physics from the University of British Columbia, his PhD in astronomy from the University of Toronto, and for five years was on the faculty at Caltech. We invite you to join us for this special edition of the John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program. I'm John Ankerberg, and my guest today is astronomer and astrophysicist Dr. Hugh Ross. Hugh obtained his Bachelor of Science degree in physics from the University of British Columbia and his PhD in astronomy from the University of Toronto. And if that was not enough punishment, he joined the staff at Caltech. Uh, California did postdoctoral research on quasars. And then in 1986, he established the ministry, Reasons to Believe. So he's been a busy guy. Plus, I know that he has spoken at more than 300 universities in terms of forums or talking with other scientists and comparing views. And I'm just saying, I don't know how he does it all. Plus, he's an author. And uh, the book that we're offering during this series, The Creator and the Cosmos, is a fantastic book, and so I hope that you'll get that. And uh, today, Hugh, uh, we are really going to start with something that people have not heard, and that is uh, when I was in school 40, 50 years ago, I went to uh, universities that were not Christians. They were all state or they were secular institutions, okay? Got two masters and a doctorate. And uh, at that time, the very astronomers that we're going to be talking about were against the Big Bang. They were against many of the theories that uh, were floating around at that time, and they were advocating something that the bottom line was God did not do it, okay? God was not involved in our universe. What I've found in reading your books is many of these men that I knew, either hearing them do lectures or reading their books when they were against God, have changed their mind over the 40, 50 years since I was in the university. And you say the discovery of this degree of design in the universe, which we see all around us, which we've been talking about, is having a profound theological impact on the very astronomers that I used to listen to 40, 50 years ago. And I want the people to hear what they are saying now as compared to when they were saying it then. And you know a lot of these guys personally. And I'd like to start with Fred Hoyle. He was a staunch atheist, uh, very vocal, and uh, well-known, and one of the things that he said, I do not believe that any scientist who has examined the evidence would fail to draw the inference that the laws of nuclear physics have been deliberately designed. Now, he's saying that now, that's not what he said then. He was leading the steady state theory at that time. Why did he change his mind? Well, he's, he's dead now, but he was steady state all of his life. Although in the last years, he talked about the quasi steady state model because he realized his original steady state wasn't working. But his quasi steady state wasn't working either. So he remained committed to that. He remained committed to his Hindu worldviews. But he was part of a four scientist team that back in the 1950s 
tried to figure out where do all the elements come from. And they recognize that the universe begins with hydrogen and helium, but how do we get past the helium barrier? And it was Fred Hoyle, along with uh, Willie Fowler and uh, Jeffrey and Margaret Burbage, that recognize it takes incredible fine tuning of the ground state energy levels of helium, beryllium, carbon, and nitrogen to get a universe that actually has roughly equal amounts of carbon and oxygen. Yeah, and he was so impressed, he put out this statement. A super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as with chemistry and biology. That's yeah. quite a statement. It is, but he recognized, notice that the organisms that we see here on planet Earth are oftenly designed to take advantage of those equal amounts of carbon and uh, oxygen. And so, yeah, the chemistry is fine-tuned, the physics is fine-tuned, the biology is fine-tuned, and there has to be some intelligent agency behind it. Yeah, Paul Davies is another uh, astrophysicist and has moved from promoting atheism to conceding that the laws of physics seem themselves to be the product of exceedingly ingenious design. What a statement. Well, he based that on the fact that it takes incredible fine-tuning of the different laws of physics to get a universe where you got atoms and molecules. Uh, any slight change, you get no atoms or molecules at all, and there'd be no possibility for life. Yeah, and he went on, he further said, there is, for me, powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. The impression of design is overwhelming. And then he said, it seems as though someone has fine-tuned nature's numbers to make the universe. Yeah, and he wasn't just referring to the laws of physics. He says, when we look at the features of the universe, every one of the features we observe has to be fine-tuned to a very particular number in order to make life possible in the universe. Yeah, here's another one. Astronomer George Greenstein in his book, The Symbiotic Universe, said these things. As we survey all the evidence, the thought insistently arises that some supernatural agency, or rather with a capital agency, must be involved. Is it possible that suddenly, without intending to, we have stumbled upon scientific proof of the existence of a supreme being? Was it God who stepped in and so providentially crafted the cosmos for our benefit? What a statement. It is a statement, and it's basically making a point that scientists around the world have noted, is that advances in physics and astronomy have brought us to a point where physics and astronomy can now address theological issues. A hundred years ago, there really wasn't this theology. Today, it's there. Now, I'm not saying these people become Christians, but they have recognized there has to be some mind behind it all, uh, some super intellect that's responsible for what we see here. Yeah, theoretical physicist Tony Rothman in a popular level article on the Anthropic Principle, which is basically was this done for man's benefit. He said, when confronted with the order and beauty of the universe and the strange coincidences of nature, it's very tempting to take the leap of faith from science into religion. I am sure many physicists want to I only wish that they would admit it. Well, it's like what you see in Romans chapter 1. God has revealed his truth through the creation. But it's our independent, autonomous nature that causes us to rebel against God as the authority over life. We want to run life ourselves. I think that's what he's referring to. The evidence is there. Uh, submitting to it is the problem. Yeah, physicist Freeman Dyson wrote two books and he concluded in his treatment of the anthropic principle. Uh, the problem here is to try to formulate some statement of the ultimate purpose of the universe. In other words, the problem is to read the mind of God. I do not feel like an alien in this universe. The more I examined the universe and study the details of its architecture, the more evidence I find that the universe in some sense must have known that we were coming. Yeah, what Dyson is referring to is that when we astronomers look at the universe, we're looking at the universe of the past, because it takes light time to reach our telescope. 
But we're actually at a point now where we can observe the entire past history of the universe. And Freeman Dyson is pointing out throughout that entire observed history of the universe, we see that the universe is being step by step by step prepared for the entry of human beings. And he added this important point, not just for the entry of human beings, but for some destiny or purpose for humanity. Yeah, Arno Penzias, who shared the Nobel Prize for Physics for the discovery of the cosmic background radiation, he said this, astronomy leads us to a unique event, a universe which was created out of nothing, one with the very delicate balance needed to provide exactly the conditions required to permit life and one which has an underlying, one might say, supernatural plan. Yeah, he's making two key points here, that the universe has to be created by some causal agent outside of matter, energy, space, and time. But he's not just a deistic God, he's a theistic God and that he's intimately involved in crafting the universe after he creates it so that humans can enter and fulfill their eternal destiny. I've got another quote here that I find very, very interesting. In a brief history of time, which was the 1991 documentary about Stephen Hawking, Hawking's colleague and distinguished mathematician Roger Penrose commented, I would say the universe has a purpose. It's not there just somehow by chance. Well, it shows you what's happened in the community of cosmologists in that there is now a desire to talk about the philosophical implications. Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose, who combined to write the first of the space-time theorems, actually taught a class at Cambridge University where they alternated, but it was a debate. And so you have Stephen Hawking defending a deistic interpretation of the universe, and you've got Roger Penrose defending a theistic interpretation. <laughs> Neither were believers, but one was arguing for an impersonal God, the other was arguing for a personal God, and they actually wound up publishing a book that documents what happened in their course. Give you another one. Hawking and Penrose colleague George Ellis made the following statement in a paper delivered at the second Venice Conference on Cosmology and Philosophy. I don't know if you were there. We were no, there. I wasn't there, no. Okay. The quote is, amazing fine tuning occurs in the laws that make this complexity possible. Realization of the complexity of what is accomplished makes it very difficult not to use the word miraculous without taking a stand as to the ontological status of that word. They were talking about the design in the world. They were, and a story about George Ellis, he's an astrophysicist, he walked into the wrong lecture hall at a conference. <laughs> it was a lecture hall on nutrition and diet. But as he's listening there, he realized, wow, there are certain proteins in the human body that depend crucially on the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics. And he walked out saying, even the uncertainties in the universe have to be fine-tuned to make our existence possible. Yeah. Here's one that uh, blew my mind when I read it, and I had to read it a couple times. Stephen Hawking himself conceded this. It would be very difficult to explain why the universe should have begun in just this way, except as an act of God who intended to create beings like us. And you can extend that principle to our super galaxy cluster, our galaxy cluster, our local group of galaxies, uh, our gal galactic arm that we're in, uh, local bubble, local fluff. It's designed all the ways, not just at the level of the universe. And that's where I'm hoping that my peers will actually begin to consider just how ubiquitous this design is. Yeah, cosmologist Edward Harrison makes this statement. He says, here is the cosmological proof of the existence of God, the design argument of Paley, updated and refurbished. The fine-tuning of the universe provides prima facie evidence of the deistic design. Take your choice, a blind chance that requires multitudes of universes or design that requires only one. Many scientists, when they admit their views, 
inclined toward the teleological or design argument. Now that might be tough for a lot of people to unscramble, but unscramble that for them. Well, back in the 1980s, I was telling public audiences this fine-tuning design evidence for the specific bent of humanity is going to become so overwhelming and so pervasive that people who are scientists who do not want to submit to the God of the Bible are going to speculate there's an infinite number of universes. And they're all different. And our universe has these fine-tuned features by pure chance. That was in the 1980s. In the 2000s, that's exactly where the atheists went. They had nowhere else to go but to hypothesize this infinite number of universes. But it was Leonard Susskind, uh, an agnostic astrophysicist, said, we atheists have got to stop using the multiverse. It's a bad argument. It explains everything. An argument that explains everything explains nothing. What I've done in that book, The Creator and the Cosmos, is to give you an analogy. If you've got an infinite number of universes, you're going to have an infinite number of planets just like Earth. On an infinite number of planets, you're going to have an infinite variety of birch tree species. And what do birch trees do? They peel white pieces of bark. But if you've got an infinite variety of birch tree species, one species will be peeling, at least one, rectangular pieces of thin white bark that measure eight and a half by 11 inches, which will fall on soils with random chemicals in them that'll make random markings on these pieces of birch bark that will duplicate all the scientific papers, including equations, <laughs> diagrams, figures, photographs that have ever been published, meaning that, hey, all those scientific research papers, they didn't come from the minds of human beings. The multiverse did it. Wow. Well, let's take uh, astrophysicist Robert Jastrow. He was very outspoken agnostic, and he best described what has happened to his colleagues as they have measured the cosmos. He said, for the scientist who has lived by the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. And as he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. Yeah, you know, waiting to congratulate them on their discovery. What I love about that is making the point that you see in Psalm 19. God has clearly revealed himself through two books, the book of nature and the book of scripture. And it was years ago, I was involved in a conference with 15 theologians and 15 physicists. I was the only one that was in both camps. They were sitting opposite to one another. For 30 minutes, they didn't say a word. They were terrified of one another. But then over the course of the weekend, they realized we're on the same turf. Your book is revealing the same thing that our book is revealing. They cooperate one another. Yeah, in your book, you talk about a lot of these conferences, over 300 at different universities all around the world. Just about everybody that's anybody has been to these conferences and you know them. And you wrote in your own book, astronomers by nature tend to be independent and iconoclastic. If an opportunity for disagreement exists, they will seize it. But on the issue of the apparent fine tuning of the cosmos for the benefit of life, and human beings in particular, the evidence is so compelling that I have yet to hear of any dissent. Yes, I do see that they all agree that design is there. Their reluctance is to attribute the design to the God of the Bible. They're also reluctant to attribute the design as something that's necessary to make us human beings possible. It was a Brazilian astronomer who wrote a paper a few years ago making the point the anthropic principle has become the prebiotic principle. What do we need in the way of the universe to be designed to make possible the building blocks of the simplest life form? It's basically a demonstration that these scientists, looking at all this overwhelming design, want to push God back. Oh, it's not designed for us. It's designed for these microbes. No, it's not designed for the microbes. It's designed for the building blocks. That's why that Brazilian astronomer and myself are both involved we need to restore the anthropic principle. 
It's designed to make possible billions of humans living on this planet at one time so we can discover God and build a relationship with Him. Yeah. He wants a relationship with us. He's provided us with the evidence we need. You got all these guys saying they've changed their mind, but they won't put themselves in, into the hands of the creator of the universe and follow him. What advice would you give to them? Well, I've seen a number of them go the whole way and give their lives to Jesus Christ. Uh, but it takes time. So I tell my fellow believers, when you're dealing with a scientist at that level, be patient, answer their questions, challenge them to dig deeper. Don't just look at the evidence they've seen. See if they see it everywhere. If it's everywhere, that's got to say something to you. And hey, don't be afraid of your peers. I mean, we're to humble ourselves before the greatest being in the universe. Don't you want to please him? Yeah. Folks, next week we are going to do a very interesting topic. As you look at all these pictures and you think about the God who designed it, we're going to talk about information that he thought of before he made the universe. And he, when he made the universe and he made earth, and when he gave us the Bible, 2,000 years before science, he started putting little pieces of information, scientific information, that the scientists are just finding out now. And it's in the Bible. And we're going to look at some of this information that is there that nobody knew about up until the present day. And what does that say about the one who put the information there through the prophets? And then what did Jesus himself say? And we're also going to talk about, I'm going to ask Hugh to show us when we get to Jesus. Jesus claimed that he had all power in heaven and earth. And after his resurrection, he walked right through doors that were closed, and he came in and talked to the disciples. How can a person in our dimensions walk through doors that are locked? He's going to give you a demonstration of how that can be done next week. I hope that you'll join us. Stay tuned for scenes from next week's program. Thanks for joining me today. If you'd like to have all of the information in our six TV programs with Dr. Hugh Ross, they're available on two DVDs for a gift of $78. Now in program one, Dr. Ross explains things that happened when the universe was 100 billionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second old that made it possible for the universe to be the right size at this time in history so that we can have life on Earth. In program two, we know that in our Milky Way galaxy, there are about 300 to 400 billion stars. Yet there are at least about two trillion galaxies in the universe with billions and billions of more stars. Why did God have to create so many stars and galaxies in the universe so human life could exist on Earth? In program three, why did the Kobe satellite in 1992 give scientists convincing proof that the cosmic background radiation of the universe proved the Big Bang model was true. Then, in program four, can we change climate change? An astronomer, Dr. Hugh Ross, gives scientific solutions to climate change and explains how we can stabilize the climate to benefit all life on planet Earth and to benefit us economically and to benefit our health and the health and well-being of all of humanity. In program five, Dr. Ross tells us why many of the world's leading physicists, astronomers, and cosmologists that used to be atheists changed their mind after studying the intricate design of the universe and they now believe in God or an all-powerful designer. In program six, Dr. Ross talks about how the Bible predicted information about the creation of the universe 
that only the creator who created it would know. What does that tell us about the Bible? Now, in addition to these six programs on DVD, if you'd like to read Dr. Hugh Ross's 333-page book called The Creator and the Cosmos, it is available for a gift of only $15. If you'd like to have all six programs plus the book, they are available together for a gift of only $90. You may order these items right now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. You may call that same number any day this week, 24 hours a day, or you may order these items at our website right now at jashow.org, where we have a secure place for you to give your gift. That's jashow.org. And then, if you live in Canada, would you please call us at 1-866-746-5803. That's 1-866-746-5803. And our Canadian website is jashow.ca. That's jashow.ca. And when we receive your gift, we will send you a receipt and a personal thank you. And I'll appreciate your help very much. Next week on The John Ankerberg Show. Well, John, we've been talking about how astronomers have been able to demonstrate and prove that time has a beginning, that the universe is the beginning of matter, energy, space, and time. But the Bible said it first. Thousands of years ago, you got multiple Bible authors speaking about the universe having this space-time beginning and how there's a God beyond space and time that brought it into existence. So the fact that the Bible said it thousands of years before scientists discover it really does mean that we really have a secure basis for concluding the God of the Bible really does exist. He's the one that created and designed everything. Our goal is to present the evidence for the gospel worldwide and to encourage Christians in their walk with the Lord. This program is sponsored by the John Ankerberg Show Ministries and is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.